Good morning, everyone. I'd like to bid you a very warm welcome to church this morning and also to wish you and yours uh, a blessed 2024 as we come and mark the end uh, of 2023 and look forward uh, to the year that lies ahead. Bible uh, week prayer meeting, uh, so uh, the Tubmore uh, Bible week is coming up and to start off in preparation for that uh, on Wednesday night uh, in lieu of midweek as such we have the first of our Bible week prayer meetings and that will take place in Kilcronaghan Parish Church at 8pm conducted by the Reverend Rosie Diffin. Uh, so we encourage our congregations uh, to be part of that in praying and preparing uh, for Tubmore uh, Bible Week. Then uh, the following week, the prayer meeting will be in Tubmore Presbyterian Church. Uh, that's the 10th of January at 8 p.m. And so uh, since we're hosting it, I uh, would encourage your attendance at that as well. Uh, and just uh, uh, today we're looking forward into the new year and just to give you a couple of things the faith mission tractor night with george Cohn. Uh, so george Cohn as well known having spoken on the um the ferguson family and having spoken about the john deere uh, family um he's coming to Drippestown on thursday the 29th of february uh, so we have a location to identify for that in a time but just to put in the diaries uh, that uh, we're having that event uh, to indicate we're not hosting a capenry team uh, in 2024 on the 17th of march open day uh, will go ahead uh, at a format to be discussed uh, so those are just a couple of pointers to help us plan and give dates in the diary uh, for the weeks and months ahead our call to worship this morning comes from joshua chapter 1 and verse 9 it says have not i commanded thee be strong and of a good courage be not afraid neither be thou dismayed for the lord thy god is with thee whithersoever thou goest and so as we prepare to enter in uh, to a new year the words of joshua bring us great encouragement that whatever that year holds for us the lord our god is with us let's turn to a mission praise and our opening praise is found in mission praise 649 the king of love my shepherd is whose goodness faileth never mission praise 649 
let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, our God, on this your day and on this the last Sunday of 2023, we are those who have gathered to worship you and bow before you in awe and reverence. Father God, as we come uh, from that in-between period of days between Christmas and New Year when the days become confused uh, as we lose our routine and yet there is busyness and yet there is activity, we pray, Lord, that you indeed would help us to be still before you, that we would come with heart and mind and spirit to worship and honor and adore you this day. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us as we gather here in obedience to your will because we acknowledge that you are the creator God who has created us in your image. And it is our calling. And Lord, in our own way, it is our desire, weak and feeble as it may be at times, but it is our desire to worship and honor and glorify you. Father, we ask that in your unfailing love that you would forgive us uh, for the sins that we have committed for the times when we have disobeyed your holy word. We ask, Father, that you would strengthen, guide, and enable us to be more obedient to you. And yet, like Paul, we know that we do the things which you detest. Father, we pray and call out to you that you would strengthen us for the spiritual battle, that we would walk in your strength and not in our might. Lord, the prophets, uh, as we have reflected upon in the Christmas season, foretold your coming. The heavens celebrated your birth and believers down through the ages have repeated indeed the songs of the angels. Lord, we recognize that you, the Son of God, you humbled yourself to become man, to become a servant, raising us up so that by faith we can share in your wonderful glory. We can obtain the prize, the trophy at the end of time as we live by faith. Lord, we come this day and we pray that in our worship, your Holy Spirit would be in our midst. We pray that in our worship, your Holy Spirit would guide us, that it would direct our words of praise, our words of prayer, our thoughts and reflections and the teaching of your Holy Word. And so, Father, we pray that we may be a people this day who are encouraged, strengthened, and filled with hope and are reminded that you are with us wherever we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we want to share with uh, the young people uh, as we later think uh, and read uh, from uh, the the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Uh, And the verse we want to think about with the young people uh, and with ourselves uh, later on is verse 14. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 14 says, I press onwards towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm sure we all get excited about the opportunity to win a competition or to win a prize. Uh, And it's great that whenever people come and maybe whenever you had visitors over Christmas, you you were able to point to the mantelpiece or to a cupboard or up in your room, you had a trophy, you had a prize, you had something that you won during the year. Your trophies might be much, much bigger than mine, but I brought one or two, at least smaller ones, to show you. So whenever we think about a trophy, we, we, we think about a cup, we, we maybe think uh, about the football competitions and, and how the different football clubs compete over the season 
to win a trophy, to win a cup, and then they can display it in their cabinet and say, we are the champions, or we won, we were the first. We have a trophy to let you know that we were very good in the competition, that we won the competition, that we finished, we finished first. And so sometimes, maybe if you look at your, your trophy at home, there, there'll be a, a model on the top, and maybe if you're a snooker player, it, it, it'll show someone bent over in, in a pose taking a shot. Maybe if, if you play football, it, it, it'll show you a person standing with the football at their foot. So it will remind you of which competition it was. So you can think of your, your sport, and you can think of winning a trophy. To win a trophy, what have you to do? Do you normally get a trophy for turning out for the first match in the league? Do, do you normally get a trophy just for turning up? Trophies are normally given out for something longer term, aren't they? They're, they're given out at the end of a season or the end of a number of rounds of a competition. So it takes time. You have to persevere at the sport. You have to stick at it. Not just for the first match, but for a number of them. But to be able to be able to stick at it and to be able uh, to, to win, you have to do a number of things, don't you? As well as turning up, you have to practice. You just can't win a competition by coming to the match. You have to prepare and you have to practice. So if you're into football or whatever your sport is, you have to practice shooting at the goal. Or if you're the goalkeeper, you have to practice keeping the ball out of the, the net. You have different activities. You have different things to practice. Uh, and then the, the, there's the, the pattern of the team uh, and the formation. Uh, and you have to remember the, where you're playing, your position, uh, and what you're supposed to be doing. And then as well as that, you, you have to be aware of the rules uh, and you have to spend time uh, reading the rules or being taught the rules uh, so that you know whenever you go to play in your competition uh, that you don't make a mistake, you, you don't get disqualified or you don't get penalty points or you don't get a card so that you're able to keep playing on. So you have to persevere, you have to know the rules, and you have to put in the practice. And so to get a trophy, whatever it is, wh whether it be for, for winning, or if maybe you're, you're in a competition and you get a rosette, and rosettes are different colors, and not everybody gets a red for first, you maybe get a different one, but you've participated and you've got a prize. Boys and girls, that, that reminds us uh, about life and it reminds us about our Christian faith. Because Paul tells us that, that there is a prize, there's a trophy that lies ahead of us. And it's for those who finish the race. It's for those who persevere. So we just don't get a trophy for being a Christian for a day. God wants us to be a Christian to the end of our life. And then in heaven, we will receive our crown, our prize, our trophy. We can't quit. We have to keep on going. And to be able to, to, to compete, to live out our life of faith, we have to know what the rules are. We have to know the instructions that we're to follow. And so the rules, the instructions, the directions are found in God's Word. And so it's a great encouragement for all of us, no matter what age, 
a, to make it a habit of reading and learning from God's word as we start the new year day by day so that it will instruct us how to live life, how to follow God's instructions so that we would be able to press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward. So I trust that just as you enjoy competing in your competitions, whether it be for music or sport or whatever, whether it be at home or at school, that you will enjoy living for Jesus Christ, that you would follow him as, as your Lord and as your Savior, and that you would be instructed and guided by God's holy word, and that one day you'll receive the trophy, the prize from Almighty God. Amen. Let's turn to praise God, and we're turning then to Mission Praise 702. And just as we're reminded about the competition going on and our faith is to last to the end of our lives, so this, this praise reminds us that God again is with us through all the changing scenes of life. Mission Praise 702. Let's praise God. And as we get tempted at this time of year to use that word resolutions, New Year's resolutions, uh, surely uh, the closing verse of that hymn uh, would be a great basis for making a resolution uh, for 2024. Make you his service uh, your delight. Uh, is that our 
goal is that our aim in the incoming year uh, to make the service of Almighty God our delight. And so we trust that indeed it will be our priority. Let's come now to read from God's Word. And we're going to read from Philippians chapter 3. It's found on page 1180 in our Pew Bibles. And we're going to read uh, from verse 1 and for the whole of the chapter. So it's a letter uh, of Paul. It's to the Philippians. Uh, This letter is to the people of the Roman colony of Philippi in northern Greece. It's known also uh, as one of the captivity letters written by Paul during the time he was imprisoned in Rome. Uh, And Paul's intention was to encourage the Christians that were reading this letter to press on uh, and to obtain the prize uh, despite the difficulties that they were facing. And so no matter what 2023 is a year has been like for you and for me, Philippians is an appropriate book, an appropriate letter of Paul to turn to. So chapter 3 from verse 1, let's hear God's word. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glorify in Christ Jesus, and who put to confidence, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reason, To put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, And now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control 
will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Amen. And may God bless this reading of his word to us. Let's come uh, before our God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we bow in your presence today, we come thankful for many things. We thank you, Lord, for this uh, Christmas season. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity of worship, of singing carols, of familiar readings, of meeting with friends and family, with enjoying food, and the opportunity to remember the birth of Jesus Christ, the one who came uh, to be your Savior. Father, we come now today to thank you for the year that is drawing to its close. We thank you, Father, for the health, the strength, the blessings that you granted to us. Indeed, your grace in giving us a time to learn and to reflect and to, to draw closer to you in service. And Father, as we acknowledge the passing of one year, as your people, we look forward to a new year and trust that in your will, you would guide, direct, and bless us as we seek to serve you. Father, we pray for our congregation in the coming year. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to be one that will grow and to be missional and to know your blessing. And Father, that you would help us as individuals to grow and to know your power in our lives. Father, again, we pray for those families who are serving as missionaries, both abroad and those who have come to serve, Lord, here in our land. We pray for your blessing uh, to be upon them. Lord, we pray for Gary and for Mary. Uh, read that you would be near to them. And Lord, uh, that during this time spent back uh, in Northern Ireland, that you would be near to them and bless them. And Lord, we pray that you would guide us and prepare us for them coming uh, to spend time with us in February as part of our worship. Lord, we come uh, and we lay our plans, our hopes, and indeed our fears for the year individually and as a congregation in your hands. We pray, Father, that you would draw us closer to you, that you would strengthen our times of prayer, that you would encourage our understanding of your word, and, Father, that you indeed would be real to us so that we would know that each day you are walking with us wherever we go. Lord, we remember those in our congregation and family circles who are ill at this time. We pray for your hand of healing, and strength to be upon them. Lord, we thank you again uh, for those who care, whether it be family members, whether it be care teams, or whether it be hospital nurses and medical folks. We give you thanks for their experience, for their talents, Lord, for their interest. And so we pray at this time that you would grant them, Lord, refreshment, you would grant them rest and encouragement. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we turn to God's word, let's uh, go again to Mission Praise. This time uh, to Mission Praise 459 as we sing the words, Master, speak thy servant here. Mission Praise 459. <laughs>
And so with those words of praise, we trust indeed that the Master uh, will speak uh, to each one of us. Today is the last Sunday. Today is the last day of 2023. And we'd like in our worship and in the preaching of God's Word to take uh, verse 14 of Philippians chapter 3 as our text. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Christians, they have, by the gift of grace, they have an inclination to look to the future. Yes, they acknowledge the past, and yes, they live and relate to the present, but they are those who are very much focused heavenward they are those who are focused to the future and to the receiving of their prize and so they're less inclined to want to live in the past and we acknowledge that the year of 2023 is coming to its end it's in the past we can't change it we can't make it different it's happened we can only live for today or in today and look forward to tomorrow. So no matter what kind of year it was for you or for me, whatever kind of year it was for this church, it is past. It's in the history books. And Paul tells us to live our lives so that we press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenwards in Christ Jesus. And to be able to know Jesus Christ, to be able to press onward heavenward, the Philippians and we have to have that relationship by faith in Christ. Paul, in this chapter 3, used righteousness, a word that incorporates the idea of salvation, but is more extensive in meaning, a word borrowed indeed from the Old Testament. By faith, man takes onto himself the righteousness of Christ on the basis of which he is justified before God. Faith justifies insofar as it takes possession of Christ writes one of the theologians. Paul emphasizes to the Philippian recipients of this letter that this righteousness of God cannot be bought, it cannot be earned, or it cannot be merited. This righteousness comes as a free gift from Almighty God without charge through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and through a personal faith in Him alone. Paul, the author and the writer of this letter, Paul declares that he has a personal testimony of faith. He shares with the, the readers to encourage them. He tells them that he is not afraid. He tells them about the glory of God. He tells them about how God has been with him, how God is building the church. And how God, in turn, is willing to do the same for those who read this letter. We, as a church, have looked back and marked 180 years of this building. The church in the time of Paul could do no such thing. They could only look back weeks and months and a few years. They didn't know how long the church was going to survive. They were just at the beginning of something new, and they were looking forward in anticipation, expectation that the church would thrive and the church would continue to exist. And so Paul encourages these people as individuals to live for Christ and as churches, as gatherings of believers to live and to strive forward. From Paul's perspective, it seems likely that faith that leads to righteousness also leads 
to the participation in Christ's sufferings. And you pick up a sense of that in verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then he goes on, and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Paul could, could understand that as he headed heavenward, as he sought the prize, the goal, there would be suffering, there would be challenges, there would be difficulties, there would be sufferings along the way, because that is how Christ lived. He lived a life where there were sufferings. For Paul, faith in many ways was far removed from the cozy Western perception that we have of Christianity now in the 21st century. Paul had understood that the Christian life faithfully lived would contain challenge, would contain difficulty, and would contain suffering. And he was up front with his people, and he presented that to them as individuals and as churches. He told them faith in Christ would bring rich reward. But during this journey of faith on earth, there would be days of difficulty. There would be seasons of suffering. Faith was about suffering at the hands of the Roman Empire. Faith was about sufferings due to the, the negative effects of selfish believers. There was suffering due to the threat to the church of false teachers, all described by Paul in this chapter. And yet, when dealing with this letter to the church at Philippi, we see a constant theme of joy pervading the whole letter, indicating that the future reward was going to make it all the worthwhile. For those of you who are into sport or into competing, you will know that the weather doesn't put you off, whether it's sunny or snowy. You ply on, you go for your practice, you keep up that routine. I was listening to an athlete being interviewed um, just a few days after Christmas. It must have been part of a review of the year. And they were saying that they got Christmas Day off, but they were back to training on Boxing Day. They had one day off in the year as they maintained their momentum as they kept up the practice to win the competition that they were preparing for. In the midst of suffering, Paul sent his letter to encourage the people to be strong in their faith. And so we are encouraged, whatever we're going through, by this same letter to be strong in our faith. As a church, as a congregation, to be strong in living for God and in sharing and reaching out with that good news to those around us. Paul did that. And Paul wanted the church in Philippi to do that, just as Almighty God desires that for us here in Draperstown. To persevere in the faith, to endure the suffering, whatever shape or form it takes, and to press on towards the goal, sharing the good news with those that we meet. The, the state of sanctification, of becoming more holy, is experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection. Paul again alludes to that in verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He was willing to participate in the sufferings. And that naturally leads on. Suffering can bring about sanctification. Sanctification can be defined as that gracious and continuous operation of the Holy Spirit by which he purifies the sinner, whereby the Holy Spirit renews his whole nature in the image of God, and so strengthens, equips, and enables the Christian to perform good works. In the time of Paul, the false teachers had already started to exist, 
And the false teachers taught that people could be made perfect by observing the law, by reading God's word. And we in our age, we have people who declare plenty of ways of how we can be good. There are plenty of good things, good ideas put forward. But those good things in and of themselves are not what get us into heaven. They are not the things that make us holy. Our firm foundation is first to be your faith in Christ. And then to seek to understand the rules of the game. How we are to live as explained and detailed in God's word. There were those in Paul's day who argued that they could be perfect before they arrived in heaven. And Paul argues if anybody could be perfect, it's me based on my family tree, based on my zeal for living out the faith. For my zeal for persecuting the church. Paul says, if anybody could get into heaven, I could. But he says, I can't. I'm not good enough without Christ. And so he warns those who are listening to the false teachers that they can't get in by being perfect. And they can't be perfect without faith in Christ. And so we're to be mindful of that, that as we follow Christ, as we strive to serve him in 2024, that we will not be perfect and that there will be those days when we will fail Christ. And disappointing as that is, we're not to give up. We're to acknowledge that we're not perfect. We're to acknowledge that we're a work in progress. We're to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is striving with us The Holy Spirit is working on our sanctification, our holiness. But we are on that journey heavenward, seeking that prize, that trophy that God has prepared for us. As we fall short, as we sin, we are encouraged to repent of that sin and then learn how not to repeat that sin again. And so step by step, we become more holy. Paul is so zealous for the resurrection. He talks about in in verse 11, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And ultimately, that is uh, the the goal of of the the Christian, uh, to be resurrected to eternal life in the presence of God. As we live our earthly lives, we are in pursuit of that gift of eternal life, of that resurrection from the dead through faith in Christ. And Paul, Paul writes to the churches on different occasions. He writes letters to the church at Rome. He writes letters to the church at Corinth that they would have spiritual transformation into the image of Christ. And despite the suffering to be endured, and Paul, as we say, doesn't shy away from that, despite the suffering to be endured, endured, Paul is fully assured, he's fully confident of a resurrection, and that fills him with great joy. And that belief by Paul in the resurrection of the body was an indication of a sure future. was an indication of an intense desire to know Christ so that he would obtain the prize prepared in heaven. That was his desire not only for himself, but for the church in Philippi and for the other churches, just as it is God's desire for us to have a belief in the resurrection of the body, to have an intense desire to know Christ. And so that's a challenge for us with all the things that compete with our, on our screens, on our airwaves, in our thoughts. 
the challenge for us is to pursue Christ, to know him more fully, to know him better, to serve him better. And so that will be one of the challenges for all of us this incoming year, is how to stay focused, how to know more of Christ with everything else that is going on around us, important as they may be. And so Christ calls for the people Paul calls for the people to be anchored in Christ. And Christ's desire is that we too would be firmly anchored in this incoming year in him. Sadly, so often in our Christian lives, we, we settle for second best. We, we settle for knowing Christ, but really striving after other things. And Paul directs the focus of the church. In Philippi, he directs our focus this morning to press onward, heavenward, and to be more Christ-like. Is that my desire? Is that your desire for the incoming year as you make plans, uh, as you think about the year that lies ahead? What are your priorities? I, I was reading something during the week and it said if you have a list of more than three things, then they're not priorities. So what are the three things that are central to our new year? What is it? Is Christ one of those priorities? Paul wants that to be the case. Christ wants that to be the case that we would strive and press on to know God. Paul is trying to relate to his audience through the imagery of the Roman games of that time. He's talking about pressing on. He's talking about stretching full out. And I suppose if we wanted to try and apply that uh, today where well, we could think about a jockey riding the horse to win the race uh, and sometimes they talk about uh, a horse winning the race by, by a nose uh, and the horse is just stretched out towards the finish line it's so close it's just because the horse is stretched out further we've talked about athletes many athletes preparing for the commonwealth games or for the olympic games and they train for a, a four-year period they push themselves mentally and physically to win a medal and that's the type of effort that paul wants us to picture to put into our christian living to strive to stretch out to know christ better in the coming year the language in these verses is all about looking forward and ultimately looking upward to that heavenly prize and to meeting jesus personally paul just didn't want to know about jesus rather he wanted to know jesus and paul was satisfied with Christ and what he was providing but Paul was not satisfied with how he was living his Christian life he wanted to strive to be better and if Paul wanted to strive to be better how much more should we want to do the same Paul was aware of the dangers of looking back to his Jewish heritage Paul was aware of the danger of resting on his laurels. And so he urges the Philippians forward as he seeks to lead them by example. And so today we are urged to press forward. We're pre to press onward. We're to stretch forward to the high calling of following Christ. There are many challenges to that we have got others who will seek to distract us we have many things in life that will aim to deter us 
but Paul calls on us to be focused and to strive forward despite those challenges, despite the false teachers, despite the distractions. We are to stay focused on Jesus Christ. And the hope, the hope that we have, the encouragement that we have is that there is a prize in heaven. That's probably more difficult nowadays for us to, to, to accept and because we live in a culture that wants everything now. We, we want instant this, that, and the other thing. We don't want to have to wait into the future. We want it now. And yet the Christian faith is about waiting to receive that full gift from God in eternity in the future. And so we are called to live by faith, willing to endure or to receive whatever blessings that God brings our way. But ultimately, our end is receiving of the prize in heaven. And so Paul sought to encourage the Philippians as we want to encourage each other to press forward and to grow in our faith. Not to stagnate, but to press on. And during this year, I have seen those green shoots of growth and development that point us to see that we're not stagnating, that we are a people, we are a congregation, a church, who have a desire and an ambition to grow. And so we, we seek with that encouragement for God to bless us and to grow. We need to pray in the church. God's word indicates to us that he wants his church to grow. And so it is right and proper, it's biblical, it's scriptural for us to pray for growth in our church. So that's the call upon us in this place to pray either in church or in our homes to pray for the growth of our church. And to grow, we need our people to reach out. We need our people to reach out to other people. As a denomination, it's, it's not something that's unique to us. It's relevant to all our congregations that we are called to be missional. We're called to reach out. If we just concentrate on the pool or the nucleus of people that we have within our gathering, that ultimately, for a variety of reasons, becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And so, as we will discover, uh, God willing, as we enter into a new study in the book of Acts, we'll discover that the church of Jesus Christ, that the congregation of Draperstown, are called to go out, to invite others in, are called to go out and to tell others about this message that Paul was sharing with the church in Philippi and to see people coming to faith. And the church is called to grow. Paul was calling on the congregations he was writing to to grow. We will see how the church did grow in the book of Acts. And we are called to study and to learn from the early church so that we may become revitalized that we may be a congregation who once again will grow by the grace of God. And so let me just bring to your ears the words of a poem you may have come across before as we think about one year ending and a new year beginning. It's the gate of the year God knows. God knows. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. 
that shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God trod gladly into the night. And he led me towards the hills and the breaking of day in the lone east. So heart be still. What need our little life, our human life to know if God hath comprehension in all the dizzy strife of things both high and low. God hideth his intention. God knows his will is best. The stretch of years which wind ahead so dim to our imperfect vision are clear to God. Our fears are premature. In him all time hath full provision. Then rest until God moves to lift the veil from our impatient eyes. When as the sweeter features of life's stern face we heal, fair beyond all surmise, God sought around his creatures, our mind shall fill. Paul instructs us to press on. As we would say in the words of the poem, God calls us to put our hand in the hand of God. And so may we, as a congregation here, may be, we be those who put our hand into God's hand and trust him to lead us and to reveal to us the future and his will. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your blessings, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord God, for the gift of your word and the privilege of worship. Father, we thank you for the year that you've given to us. And we pray, Lord God, that we would be those who would be faithful, who would strive to be more holy, and so know you more dearly as we reach out and put our hand into your hand for the year that lies ahead. Amen. Let's conclude as we turn to the words of Mission Praise 302. Mission Praise 302. I want to walk with Jesus Christ.
now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>